So it's um, a genuine, very real privilege to uh, be able to come and talk here today. So thank you for inviting me. And um, I realise that this talk follows on very well from the previous because there's this running theme about trials, including some of the controversies about trials in the previous three talks. And uh, one of the conclusions, I think this has been mentioned by all three speakers, is about this sense of partnership between uh, patients and public and uh, clinicians, scientists, statisticians, but that sense of partnership, which is very real. And in the way that I've tried to construct this talk, I want to um, talk about some uh, projects which are in development and really in order to get that input and to spark debate. Um, so, so that's going to be an important theme. The first handful of slides, if any of you were here last year, if you looked at the videos, you will find are familiar. I have deliberately included slides from the previous year because they cover the very basics. And um, so please forgive me if you know these very well. Um, so very briefly, the point of this slide is to, is to look at immune checkpoint inhibitors, which is going to be the main focus of my talk. And it's to remind us that these do not act directly on the cancer, but act indirectly. It is the immune system that's affected by the drugs. And this is the analogy that I use commonly, both uh, with my uh, with patients and also with colleagues, which is that if you imagine the immune system as a motor, then you need to switch it on using the ignition key, but you don't need to keep flogging the ignition key, so you only need a limited number of cycles of ipilimumab, and you would need to release the brakes, and that's the anti-PD-1, nivolumab, and pembrolizumab, and uh, that's how you get the motor running. In some people, you do not need the ignition key, the motor's running already, so you can get away with just anti-PD-1, but this motor has both an ignition key and brakes, it doesn't have a steering wheel, and so it is poorly targeted against cancer and um, results in significant uh, immune reactions against normal and healthy organs. And so this, I'm sure, is familiar to you, and it just gives the information from the trial. In fact, it was quoted um, in, the, uh, in the previous talks, which is the uh, instance of adverse events. And you can see that um, if, with... Uh, Ipilimumab alone, you're looking at around about, um, oh, hang on, this is not that one, this is the, um, uh, this is the, the efficacy. Do you know what, I thought I put the wrong one in it, there's another colour-coded version of this, so I thought this was the frequency of adverse events when I put it in. So sorry about that, that's not what I was expecting. <laughs> so um, just shows when you put slides together, you can get misled by what you put in. So what I was, what I was expecting to show on that slide was that with um, ipilimumab, we are seeing something in the region of about a 30% risk of adverse events, uh, of, of quite significant, of major adverse events, sufficient to put people in hospital and to need high-dose steroids, that with um, anti-PD-1, pembrolizumab, or nivolumab, it's around about a 15% rate of significant side effects, and with the combination, it's more than 50%. So that was the, the purpose of that slide, but unfortunately, it's not on there. Um, but, uh, the, and the other point that I wanted to flag up here is the diversity of these events. So the, the events that we see very commonly are gastrointestinal, particularly colitis. We see hepatitis, so typically manifesting in, in, on the um, blood test with the patient still feeling quite well, but we certainly have seen people who have been very significantly unwell with um, hepatitis. Uh, we see inflammation in the lungs. Uh, we see skin rashes um, and, uh, and hormone failures. So those would be the big five, the most common that we see. But we also see rare and uncommon side effects. So that, so that if you can imagine developing new diabetes or having a significant visual loss because the optic nerve becomes inflamed, these are not, necess not necessarily life-threatening in their own right if they're properly managed, but they're life-changing events. So it is you know, a very significant potential for side effects. And although these significant side effects are more common with combination immune therapy, they certainly do occur on monotherapy as well and can catch people out. And this was the slide again that I showed last year, and it's just a reminder about what you're supposed to be doing so that, um, so that the advice I give to patients, if I'm just a step back, if you, in the acute oncology departments, in chemotherapy departments, I think the advice is still a kind of a warped version of what, what you would have been told if you were having chemotherapy. And so it's, there's still quite a lot of emphasis on fever and, emerg and coming into hospital urgently if you get fever. And there's um, still... Uh, 
quite a complicated list of all these possible side effects, and all done by organ. You know, so what happens if, if, if you have a lung problem, what if you have a, a gut problem? But it's much simpler than that. If you have diarrhoea and it's more than a few loose stools a day, if you have a rash that's more than one little bit of the body, then you need to phone the acute oncology number. And the, one of the enormous steps forward in the UK over the last few years is the establishment, the systematic establishment of an acute oncology service in every cancer hospital. So that's really important. But then it's this lot at the, at the right-hand side that is really tricky. It's the person who feels non-specifically unwell, with new onset tiredness, who feels generally ill, who's got kind of weakness. Weakness means what? Does it mean paralysis? It could be. It could be that actually they've got a neuromuscular problem and that they're not, uh, and that that's why they're, they're feeling very weak. Or it could be they're just really tired. So how do you tell that over a telephone? Um, headaches, breathlessness could be pneumonitis, but it could be something else. Nausea and vomiting could re represent lots of different things. Um, and so with dizziness, numbness, visual disturbance I mentioned. So people, I've had patients say, well, I've, yeah, I know I'm supposed to ring the acute oncology, but I popped down to the optician and asked them what to do. But actually, it could be something very serious. It could be inflammation at the front of the eye or the inflammation at the back of the eye or affecting the optic nerve. So that list of what's being ill in an abnormal, out-of-the-ordinary way for you as a person, that's what we're talking about here, and then we, people need to phone in. So those, that's the kind of the broad advice. And we know that these events occur in, uh, with different kinetics. So you'll see on here two important things. One is that different kinds of side effects tend to come on at slightly different times in the treatment. And the second thing is that most of what's reported here is early. It's relatively early events. And it is true to say most of the events are occurring within the first um, 16 weeks or so, but not exclusively. So... That's the end of the introductory slides, and so I want to just think about why these matter. And uh, there are three elements to this. We talked earlier on, we had slides put up about um, uh, the benefits of different treatment, and there are some people, unfortunately, who have high volume disease and for whom, regrettably, life expectancy, whatever we do, might potentially be short. So therefore, what you want to achieve, what they may want to achieve, is the best quality, quality uh, best quality of life for as long as possible, even if that does not turn into long-term survival. So significant side effects under those circumstances, I think, are an unacceptable compromise because the gains in terms of survival are not sufficient. But clearly, if you look at this cur this, these survival curves, which you've seen it already in previous presentations, where you're looking at a significant proportion of people who are going to be living many years, not months or a year or so, then what would you trade for that length of life? And are you willing to trade very significant side effects? And Pippa, uh, Pippa gave an example earlier on of a patient who has had, what was it, it was colitis, arthropathy now, hepatitis, at least those are the three, and I certainly have had people in similar positions. And now, year, year two years on, are, as, as far as we can tell, free of disease. Was that a good trade? I think from outside, not being the person living with that, that looks like a good trade. But it's not my choice. It has to be your choice. It has to be the patient's choice. So that's the issue. What would we trade for long life? And then the third issue is this issue about survivorship. It would be, and this is something we've barely touched upon, which is if people are going to be living years, let's hope, decades with this. What are the long-term consequences? And, of course, we're still at a very early stage in these treatments, so we don't really know. But we can start imagining that you could imagine people with chronic inflammatory diseases. You mentioned somebody with, with an arthropathy, arthritis. How long is that going to go on? If it's going to burn out, is it going to carry on? Are we going to see people with chronic inflammation in the bowel, so developing ulcerative colitis? So those are, might be the questions you ask. Might we see inflammation affecting other organs in the body so people could become chronically unwell in other ways? Now, this is not to say this is what's going to happen, but we don't know that in terms of the long term. So what kind of information do we have? Well, 
we do have information from our own experience, and all of us now who are treating patients in the UK have experience that goes on for a number of years. In fact, there's not that much published in terms of survivorship, and this is one example from a um, uh, hospital in um, South Africa, uh, where they identified from their retrospective cohort, and these were ipilimumab-treated patients, because they were looking at the older cohort, the cohort treated longest ago, and they identified 33 people in their cohort who had more than two years survival. Um, you can see the pattern of those patients there. And um, importantly, 10 out of that 33 had had steroids. And just as an aside, this plus other data so far suggests that if somebody is treated with steroids for a major side effect, their outcome from the cancer does not seem worse than if they, if they were one of the people who did not get side effects sufficient to justify steroids. So the steroid treatment to the immune suppression, as far as we can tell, does not seem to lead to worse outcomes. Although I have to say that there, in the detail of that, there remains some uncertainty. But that's certainly the evidence we have. These were the events they described. And I think this is a, a good example, because I think this would fit with what we're experiencing as well. So they saw one person with late-onset colitis, and late-onset colitis is, is recognised, but it got better when it was treated with steroids, and they're free of colitis. What they did not experience is people with long-term chronic and ulcerative colitis-type pattern, and I think that would fit with the, our general experience. What is interesting is they did have people with hormonal failures, and again, that's something that's familiar. So I think it's about a third of that... Um, uh, no, it's just under a third of their population, more like a, just over a quarter, had um, hormone failures that were long-term. So particularly people on chronic steroid replacement because they had failure of their pituitary gland at the base of the brain that controls your natural steroids. And they also had people who had, were on thyroid replacement. But in fact, a number of those, the thyroid recovered and they were able to come off thyroid replacement. I think an important issue is this one. I'm starting to notice in clinic, and I, I think we're, un, we're not looking for this properly, we, we, the pituitary sits at the base of the brain and it's a master controller for other glands that make hormones. And one of, one of its things that it controls are the sex hormones. And sex hormones are important in terms of obviously the menstrual cycle and importance in, main, in maintaining testosterone in men. And so that, that contributes to well-being in, in a number of ways. And one of the things that I am starting to notice, interestingly, is that some patients seem perhaps to be having the pituitary hormones going up suggesting that maybe there's a degree of failure of the sex hormones because it's a feedback loop. Now, I don't know that this is of significance, but certainly on this cohort, they had five of their patients who ended up on long-term testosterone replacement because there was some failure at that level. So I think this is perhaps under-investigated and under-looked for and might be important. But this is about primarily about quality of life. It's not, this is not dangerous, but it's about quality of life. And they did have some late hormone failings, failures here. Skin, they, they had a couple of people with late skin events, but none of it looked obviously as if it was driven by the earlier immune therapy. Again, they saw uh, early um, neurological events, but they had one patient with prolonged nerve pain, but there were lots of other reasons that might have explained that, so it's not clear that the immune therapy was causing that. Um, and... Um, so then uh, we have the, um, the brain. This was a particular concern. They saw one patient who had whole brain radiotherapy and immune therapy together, and that person did seem to have chronic damage uh, and long-term damage, as you can see here. Um, but whether that's a general experience, and of course whole brain radiotherapy is falling to some extent out of fashion, and unfortunately if you're having whole brain radiotherapy, if people have whole brain radiotherapy, certainly in our practice it's because there are very extensive brain metastases, and because if they're only a small number, we'd be using a different approach to treat that, which would spare the brain a lot of <coughs> therapy. So I think this is perhaps not seen very often, because unfortunately this is in the, um, uh, the, the poorest prognosis population. Um, and somebody had a leg stroke, but again, there were lots of other reasons that could explain that. And so these other events, pericarditis, which we worked on anti-PD-1 and uh, later on, may be relevant, may not be but they didn't find much else. So a really important point is out of their 24 survivors, 23, after a number of years, were fit, and, in, and about half of them were working. So I think that's actually a really encouraging outcome. So I think this issue about survivorship is important, but I think it's important not to be over-pessimistic about this. And this leads to the first point I, that I hope at some, either today or some other point we'll get feedback on. 
So in looking at this, I discovered that sitting on our doorstep, we have expertise, and, uh, and the expertise comes with uh, Mike Hawkins, who is a um, professor of epidemiology at Birmingham, and they run this study, which is about childhood cancer, and also in teenage um, and adult cancer survivor study. Now look at the size of these cohorts. We talked about cohort size earlier on and sample size, but you're looking at tens of thousands of patients, and indeed here, more than 200,000, because you need to be able to get really big numbers to see whether you're genuinely having an impact on health long term. And of course, these are by definition young people, and you're therefore looking over many decades. So these are big projects, big long-term projects. But one of the possibilities might be to say, is there a role for a national registry of people going on to these what are still very new treatments? Not just in melanoma, but across the board. And so one might be able to recruit onto a registry through the commission service, through pharmacy, through medical databases. But potentially you need very big numbers. It's not something that can be done on the back of a little trial. And then the outcomes also potentially come both from national databases of run through the NHS and also perhaps through regular patient contact if we had consent. And, but it would require prolonged follow-up. And the objectives would be to look at what might be the long-term health consequences of early being treated with um, these new therapies. I think it's actually an important question. And if you don't start it, you never finish. So I'd, I'd be interested to see what people think. This is not a proposal that's gone to a funding body. It's a proposal at an early stage. But it clearly, to have buy-in, to have to be successful, would have to have public buy-in. So now I'm going to turn on to the different thing. I can see my 10-minute warning. So I want to talk about short-term side effects. I'm going to focus on the gut for the remainder of this um, talk. I want to highlight that people can get relatively low-grade inflammation in the bowel, manifesting typically as diarrhea, but also with other symptoms, particularly uh, they get that low grade, particularly on the single agent. You can see across different tumour types here, you get similar kinds of numbers. And then grade three or four, which I'll talk about in more detail in a moment, but basically more severe colitis, potentially life threatening colitis, is particularly a problem when you have the ipilimumab combined with nivolumab or um, potentially with pembrolizumab, but not with the single agents. So that's um, an important issue. Um, and th there are some challenges. We, ju we just spent a long time working on this for a grant proposal um, and looking at some of the issues. And these, these are the challenges. How we categorise this is this thing called CTCAE, Common, Toxic, Common Terminology Criteria for Adverse Events. One, two, three, four. You can see they get more severe as they go up. This is a path, this is a categorisation developed to develop new drugs through phase one trials so that you take a new chemotherapy drug. And you, when you give those drugs, you then find out how toxic it is to determine the dose, as um, uh, Cindy described earlier on in a phase one trial. It was not designed to tell you what to do if you get this event. And it was not designed with immune therapy in mind. So this is still how we categorize adverse events, but it is not fit for purpose. It does not reflect the true experience of patients. Now, I put this slide up deliberately, and I know you can't read the writing, and that actually is the point. And actually, in the publication, the publication in um, the uh, 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 European Journal, you also can't read the writing, I believe, why not? Um, and the, any, any algorithm like this, it's supposed to be a simple algorithm. If you look at it, it's got arrows, and you've got an event, something happens here, and it tells you, if that happens, do this. So that, that must be easy. And we do use this. But you can immediately see it's flawed because any, any algorithm that's got writing this small means it's got too much information in these boxes, which means it's not simple at all. There are too many variables going on in the way this works. So actually, there's much more uncertainty about how we manage patients than this pathway would suggest. And there's controversy, and, there's, and the guidelines from the Americans do not match this exactly. This has its origin in the way the drug companies develop those trials, the ones you see in the results, how they manage the side effects. So they come from the drug company trials and they've come into standard clinical practice on the basis of virtually no trial evidence. Well, there is no trial evidence, but they are based on a lot of experience. And of course, we are very experienced in this, but they're not based on trials. An important part of gut events are that the gastroenterologists are involved. And they have immense experience in working with patients who've got ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, which is a natural form of colitis, a natural, if you see what I mean. It occurs without us giving drugs that induce it. Um, but 
Now, this is, this is, I run the risk here of doing doctor splaining in the sense that I'm telling you what patients feel, and that's not the intention of this slide. What I mean here is this is what we think, and actually this has got a question, is this what people experience? So this comes from a publication about inflammatory bowel disease, about what, how, what the impact is on patients and what they experience. The impact on the patients is all about GI symptoms, their quality of life, tiredness, and disability from the chronic inflammatory bowel disease. But from what I hear patients tell me, in the cancer setting, when um, colitis happens with, um, from the immune therapies, they're much more concerned to get back on treatment. They're concerned about whether the cancer's under control, and quality of life matters as well. And so these, these impacts are not the same. And so transferring across from the scoring mechanisms that gastroenterologists use, the way they assess patients, um, those tools to tell us how to grade inflammation in cancer patients and make decisions are not directly applicable. We have to rethink this. And the only way to rethink this is to ask, which is one of the reasons I'm doing this. This slide comes from um, uh, Matthew, who is going to be talking to you about a different subject in a moment, but uh, Matthew and Gareth are leading on a trial which is um, going forward to a full funding application later this year. And, and I can't, there isn't time to go through this in detail, but essentially it takes the people with the most severe colitis when they present. They obviously give consent and they would be randomised, and it essentially compares um, the steroids-only arm or uh, an inf steroids plus a more intense immune therapy. And, um, and, and whether or not you, we can get away with giving steroids alone or we have to intensify treatment. And so although it's more complex than that, and there are other ways in which people get infliximab in terms of um, follow-up, that's essentially the comparison. This is a really important attempt to rationalise the way we approach management. So go, to go back and to make that algorithm I showed earlier based on trial evidence, not on anecdote and past history. And so I really would commend this, and I think this, they will need patient input, and, um, and uh, people, particularly people who experience colitis, I think are really valuable to this. So um, that's for that. We were, uh, it's slightly bittersweet, because I have to say that we were also running a consortium to develop our own trial, and we, we did not get through that round. Um, ours had a different name. They were called Artist, Artistics, um, and ours one was called Giraffe, and I'm slightly disappointed that our, our trial name does not go forward. But the point I want to get at here remains valid, which is what we, were, what we wrestled with in the development process is this, that the, um, we were looking at the symptom-based rating and we were trying to work out how we would rationalise this. And this is based very much on patient symptoms, but going beyond how many poos people do to these kind of symptoms, upgrading people to, to what we call severe diarrhea. So I think that this, is, this, is, uh, this kind of development is important and it's, I think it still remains important for future developments in this area. And so where we think we are going, but we are, we've only just received our knockback that we're not going through to that same competition, so we're looking at what we are, do want to do. Part of our proposal had been that we were not just looking at people with severe diarrhea, as Matthew is, but we also want to look at those people with less severe diarrhea, those people who are on single agent treatment, where they get relatively moderate but not very severe um, colitis. And so that population might be able to be managed outside hospital with outpatient steroids and outpatient infliximab if they fail. This is the more intense um, su uh, suppression. And so we, we're looking at that as a potential proposal that potentially could run alongside, if it comes to, to the fore, could would go to a different funding body, but might run alongside um, the trial that, that Matthew's putting forward. But I should emphasize that that's not been round the consortium yet, so this is at a very early stage. Um, but that also provides a framework for how one might introduce targeted interventions for this pa patient population so that there might be better ways of treating people than steroids and infliximab. And so if we can establish that first, then we can start looking at more targeted interventions. And if I may finish on the last couple of slides, um, I just wanted to flag up, because it is very topical, this issue about the microbiome. And so there are a, couple, well, a number of studies that have been published recently looking both at the outcome of treatment depending on what, people, what bacteria are colonising people's guts, and also their um, susceptibility to adverse events. And I'm going to focus on adverse events here. 
the key point about this study was that those people who went on to have colitis, if you look in their bowel before they start this ipilimumab, they have a, a particular group of bacteria called the bacteroidetes were underrepresented. So these seem to, the absence or the low level of these seems to associate with a higher risk of having colitis afterwards. So that's one important um, observation. And note that this interacts then with the immune system and the level at which the immune system um, is, is susceptible to inflammation. In a separate study, then they're looking at some, somewhat similarly, but they, this is looking at people with, with colitis. Again, they're, they're seeing this same group here, that the people who are less likely to get colitis have more, are more likely to have this bacteria group. The people who are more prone are enriched in a different group of bacteria. And they then drop once they develop the colitis. But interestingly, and to make life more complicated, in terms of outcomes of treatment, perhaps the people who are more colitis prone because of their bacteria, or associated with certain bacteria, may have a better outcome from treatment. So one has to intervene in this with a degree of caution. Um, I haven't got time really to go on this. I just wanted to flag up that in ulcerative colitis, there are now experimental work about altering people's microbiome by actually moving bacteria into people's guts to, re to um, replace and colonise um, in order to change the outcomes. So that's taking place of ulcerative colitis, but you can imagine extending that into this setting, but one should do so cautiously because of the different possible outcomes. It's a complex system and something that one needs to know much more about. Going back to this issue, we need trials. You can't just go in and say, well, that's the solution. Um, so this is my summary slide. Um, so to conclude, the first few slides were really just to say, be alert. If you're on immune therapies, even late on after the starting of immune therapies, adverse events can occur. Be alert for these and make sure you use the acute oncology service. The second point is about survivorship. I think actually the outcomes are broadly encouraging that on those little sample sizes, and I think in our general experience, we're not seeing people have long-term chronic diseases, but our sample size is small. And actually, if we're really keen to know that, I think there's a value in doing a formal registry and looking um, over a much larger population. I think that there is this issue about the interaction between brain-directed therapy and immune therapy, and that, in its, that I think is a very important issue. People are very concerned, rightly, about brain metastases and long-term consequences of treatment. It's a very personal thing, one's brain. And um, so I think looking at that, I think, is a very important uh, aspect. In terms of the gastrointestinal side effects, I really do urge everybody, and so too will we, be supporting Matthew and Gareth in developing the artistics trial. And um, I think there is the potential for developing other trials in this area. Um, I think the role of a bacteria in the bowel is complex. And I, perhaps I'm, the last point I'm going to make, because I think it is important, is giving antibiotics potentially interacts with the microbiome and interacts with the outcome of treatment. That is, I think, an area which is really in its infancy, but there are a couple of reports that certainly flag concern in that area. Does this mean we should not be using antibiotics if you're on immune therapy? I don't think it does mean that, and I think it's important to say that, but I think it does mean that actually doctors should use antibiotics in, for people on immune therapy for cancer in the same way as they should use antibiotics for everybody else. They should use them sparingly for the right indication for people with clear-cut infection if they've got a dangerous infection. But the, the risk is, is that people on chemotherapy, if you come in and you have fever, quite rightly you get a big dose of a broad-spectrum antibiotic on arrival in casualty because that saves lives. That's really crucial. But whether that same pathway is the right thing on immune therapy, I think, is really open to doubt. And I think that's an area for work to say, well, what should the pathways be for people in terms of antibiotic treatment? And should we just, have, just make sure we're just following good medical practice and being sure what we're treating when we're giving antibiotics? So I think at that point I'm going to stop. Thanks, Neil.